This morning I'm going to read through our gospel and comment on it as we read through it. Um, and I'll start off by telling you how much our son Matthew dislikes glitter. He, he, he rants loud and long whenever he receives a greeting card that had that used to have glitter attached to it and he pulls it out of the envelope and the glitter goes everywhere and of course those of us who love him no occasion goes by without a glitter card <laughs> because his rants are worthy of his dad um and his issue, of course, is the stuff gets all over the place. It scatters out in every different direction, and it's just, just not tidy. That's going to be today's sermon. This is not a three points and an illustration sermon. This is not tell them, tell them, tell them what you said, and tell them again what you said kind of sermon. And it's not on one topic like a laser and staying there. There's going to be a lot of glitter going all over the place today. And I hope some of it sticks to you. And, and it might some might stick to you. Others, Some of the glitter might stick to someone else. But if you hear just a thing or two, it's a great way to end a year and start a new year. Thinking about eight days after Christmas. So let us hear the word of God. We'll begin with Luke 2 and we'll reach verses 21 through 24 to begin. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus. The name was given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When it came time for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what was stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Luke begins by telling us that the family is participating in three different religious events. First is the circumcision. This is the prescribed event that God gave to Abraham to to designate the people of God and to um, affirm the covenant. I will be your God, you will be my people. And as a sign of that, you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Every male among you shall be circumcised when he is eight days old. The family is doing what the people have always done. And this is to symbolize that God is with us. God is with us. Luke makes a big deal out of Jesus' name. God with us. And this action is the perfect symbol denoting the fact that Jesus is God with us. The second ceremony is Mary's ritual purification after giving birth. Now, the law of Moses actually prescribes sheep. I can't imagine them schlepping sheep from Nazareth 90 some miles to Bethlehem and then back up to Jerusalem. So they bought two turtle doves and two young pigeons. This is an aside that has nothing to do with the sermon. But they bought them from the vendors outside the temple whom Jesus will knock over their tables 30 years from now. Just a thought. Well, anyways, they buy the two turtle doves and two young pigeons. This might show the humble circumstances of Joseph and Mary and their family. Despite our financial place in the world, God uses us in whatever our circumstances. We might not be the richest people in the world. We might be serving a church right now that, that's struggling financially. But that's nothing new to God or the people of God. And God takes whatever we offer, whatever humble offerings we make, and God uses it. Paul tells the Romans, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The third ceremony is the dedication of the firstborn. 
Historically, the firstborn son is offered to the Lord, called a Nazarite. And here is in this ritual, Jesus takes up the name Son of God. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have life eternal. Now what's interesting is that Dr. Luke, the Greek physician, doesn't get the ceremonies completely right. He kind of messes up the ceremony. It wasn't his emphasis. I can almost hear him say, whatever, when someone who is an expert in the law or more proficient in the law or Bible study sends him a text message correcting him. You know, the, the law is for her. You know, you know. Whatever. It's a great lesson for us. There are, are people out there who are much more proficient at Bible study than we are, who can read the Bible and tell you everything about it, and apply all the life lessons imaginable, and you go, wow, they're really good. Don't let that stop you from reading the Bible. Don't let that stop you from making your own interpretations. One year, our Sunday school, um, adult Sunday school, we ran out of curriculum with about three weeks left in the, in, this, in the academic year. So we started playing Bible trivia, and I, and I was great. I kept saying, you want me on your team. I'm good at this. I am good. And so um, right after, the, the, right after uh, Memorial Day, Kim and I went to a continuing ed event, and our preacher, with, who was a friend, said, you know, uh, when we get to my, Bible, my weekly Bible study with other pastors, as soon as we walk through the door, we're not allowed to speak English anymore. We all have to speak ancient Greek. And I looked over at Kim and whispered, I guess I'm not so good at this Bible stuff as I thought I was. Don't let that stop you, though. Don't let it stop you. Read the Bible. Get what the Lord gives you out of it. Verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. This is a man of God. The Simeon, though, is a Pharisee. Now when I say Pharisee, what's the first thing you want to do? First thing I want to do is go, boo, Pharisee. It's a perfectly acceptable prejudice. Boo, Pharisee. Jesus says to us in the Sermon on the Mount, judge not lest ye be judged. Don't judge anybody. Simeon is a Pharisee, and he is an Old Testament character. But there is something new and greatly exciting about Simeon. He looks forward. He's not a backward thinker. He isn't sitting around saying, oh, yeah, when the new, when the new uh, um, Savior comes, he's going to be the new David. We're going to go back a thousand years in our history. We're going to be the strongest country here in the Near East. We're going to be just great. He's not looking back. He doesn't really care about 1,000 B.C. He isn't worried about the past high times of Judaism. Yes, we're going to build on that. We're building on the faith that the Lord God has given us. And we look forward. This is an Old Testament prophet with a new and fresh outlook. One of my heroes, Pitcher Satchel Page, is famous for saying, don't look back, something might be gaining on you. Don't look back. And the Holy Spirit rested on Simeon. This is the first Holy Spirit reference we have in this passage. And it's a very general reference. The Holy Spirit is in the room. Verse 26. It had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. This is our second Holy Spirit reference. A little bit more specific, but still, but still general. Simeon's going to live to see the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. Verse 27, guided by the Holy Spirit, Simeon came into the temple. This third reference is most specific. The Holy Spirit is shoving Simeon to go where he needs to be at that moment. And there's no coincidence here. He is pushed into the temple by the Holy Spirit. This is how the Holy Spirit works in our churches and in our lives. 
general nebulous ways, ways that we never really see, or even if we see them, we don't understand them, generally guiding us and leading us. The Holy Spirit also works very specifically sometimes. As, as Pastor Kim Nofel is fond of saying, there are no coincidences for we who believe in Jesus Christ. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do to him what was customary under the law, the family runs into Simeon. They just run into him. What are the odds? If we assume that this is the eighth day and the last day of Hanukkah, the temple is packed full of worshipers. Just packed full. It would be like running into an old classmate from Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School at St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican on Easter Sunday. What are the odds? No coincidence. The Holy Spirit has put Simeon and the long-awaited child in the same place together. The Lord puts us where we need to be. The Holy Spirit puts us where we need to be. And Simeon took the child in his arms. Great moment, but it's also frightening. Some old guy comes out of nowhere, takes my eight-day-old child. Their hearts had to stop. And then Simeon holds that child up in the midst of all this throng. He holds that child up. This is where the sermon title comes in. You remember Rafiki from the um, Lion King. The mandrel. Remember, he, he comes to the mountain and he takes the child and he holds him up. This is what I always, always picture when I think of Simeon holding that child, showing the world that the king has come. The savior of the world is right here. And he sings. Then he starts to sing. This is a song. He prays God, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. I can go to heaven happy. I have seen the Lord. It's been fulfilled. The Old Testament prophecies, all that's led up is here and has led to this moment. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and for your glory to your people Israel. This Pharisee, takes our hearts and minds back to the glory days of the people of God, of Israel, proclaiming God, Messiah, has come. And God's glory reflects on God's people. In formal language, this Pharisee hearkens back to Isaiah 40. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. My salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Now this old-fashioned man is proclaiming something brand new. God's salvation isn't just for the Jewish faith, people of the Jewish faith. The Gentiles and all the people to the ends of the earth who believe are saved in Jesus Christ's name. All of salvation is all for the world. And Simeon proclaims it when our Lord is only eight days old. Jesus loves me, this I know. Jesus loves you, this I know. For the Bible tells me so through the voice of Simeon. The Bible tells us Jesus is here for your personal salvation. And the child's mother and father were amazed at what was being said about, about him. I can be kind of hard on Joseph and Mary. Oh, come on. Angels, dreams, shepherds, all that stuff. And you're amazed? Come on. But think about how disorienting your first child can be. How sleep deprived you feel. And add to this the miracles that keep coming at them. And then things are finally calming down and they're just going to go to church going to go to church, do our church stuff. And then wham, God is here. That's life. That's what our lives are like. We're just going along to get along. And then suddenly, wham, God is in our midst. How cool. And then verse 34, Simeon blessed them. 
I pay a lot of attention to pronouns. Pronouns are important. And here it says, God, Simeon and blessed them. He blessed the child, the mother, and the father. Both received the blessing. All three received the blessing, actually. And then Simeon addresses Mary alone. And Simeon said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that he will be opposed. Maybe Simeon has Holy Spirit knowledge that Joseph won't be around during Jesus' earthly ministry. There's no reference to, to him after this, um, these stories of the birth. Um, And it's shocking that this Pharisee, speaking of God's anointed one, the Savior, predicts that Jesus will be rejected by the righteous. Jesus will eat with sinners and prostitutes. Luke 5, the Son of Man did not come to save the righteous, but the sinner. And this will be a sign that he will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. Time and again, Jesus says, that the Gospels tell us, knowing what they were thinking or murmuring among themselves, Jesus never lets the self-righteous get away with it. He always teaches a lesson and advocates for those who are not self-righteous, advocates for the sinners, the, the, the people who are messed up, the people who are struggling to get along. That's us. Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior. I'm sorry, I just thought if I wasn't Presbyterian, I'd do an altar call at this moment. And he tells Mary the hard news. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. Mary will share her son's rejection by the establishment. She will have the greatest grief a mother can have, watching a son suffer and die. Mothers are supposed to die before their children. Is it any wonder that many through the centuries have had an affinity for Mother Mary? And it's also a message for us. The Christian life is the most joyful existence imaginable. I get goosebumps saying those words. When I was practicing earlier, I stopped in the midst of my, in my practice preaching, and I went, wow, it's true. This is the most joyful existence imaginable. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. But it's not always easy. It's not always smooth. I heard a preacher once say, if the mountain were smooth, we wouldn't be able to climb it. Simeon leaves the stage. Verse 36. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phineul of the tribe of Asher. You've got to realize that these are earth-shattering words. Earth-shattering. We're supposed to stop and reread them. There was a prophet, Anna. She is only one of five people in the whole Bible who is identified as prophet by name. And the only one in the New Testament. This gives her incredible credentials. And if that wasn't enough, Luke gives her more as he describes her. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. This great age also puts her on a high pedestal. In first century, the life expectancy was about 30, 35 years. In the original Greek, which is unclear, Anna is either 84 years old or 104 years old. We aren't sure, but she has the accumulated wisdom and knowledge of all those years of being a prophet of God. One prophet, literally, one who speaks with God, one who speaks for God. And if we need more credentials, Luke tells us she never left the temple but worship there with fasting and prayer night and day, day and night. Since she was widowed at the age of 20, she has lived in the temple. Anna the prophet. 
now again speaks for God. In the prayers, think about the prayers she, she had when she was in the temple all those eons. Her prayers were from the heart. She was in the presence of God, whispering to the Lord and listening to the Lord whisper to her. Somehow or other, I've become a talker. And I talk, 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 even at God. But we got to stop and listen sometimes. Got to stop and listen. And another aspect about her prayers, I think, is that she probably began every time she prayed with the same system of prayers, with the same words, with the same liturgy over and over again. And I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with the so-called rote prayers. I remember 9-11, 2001. My emotions were so high, I could, do, I could not pray. So I opened up the Bible and I prayed with the psalmist all those prayers of lament, all those psalms of lament. And often when I'm praying with the dying, well, every time I pray with the dying, I whisper in their ear the Lord's Prayer, Psalm 23, and sing amazing grace in their lips usually move one more time as we pray together these prayers are part of us it's okay to use them verse 38 at that moment anna came she just happened to be by just happened to be by yeah she just happened because she's in the church day and night and she's around when the lord's messiah appears and as prophet she recognizes him and Anna began to praise God and speak about the child to all that were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Unlike Simeon, her prophecy isn't written down. I think it's because even though she was very wise, she was a very simple person. As a woman, she had no formal education or schooling. She just praised God and spoke about the Son of God in the simplest, most heartfelt ways. When praying and sharing our faith, we don't have to pray or share in quotable quotes. Growing up Roman Catholic, I was, I was for years very self-conscious about, um, about praying. When people say, Pastor, would you please pray? It's like, oh, what am I going to say or how am I going to say it? And um, so when we'd be in a prayer circle and, and it became time for the pastor to pray, I'd always squeeze Kim's hand three times telling her I'm not going to say anything you better you better take the pastor role here and she would pray these wonderful elegant prayers well one time we were in the prayer circle and Kim wasn't there and it came time for me to pray and I panicked and I squeezed the person's hand next to me three times and nothing happened so I had to pray so I prayed afterwards Jackie Brumley our organist she says to me Steve why were you squeezing my hand it's okay to pray. God wants your prayers. It doesn't have to be quotable quotes. It doesn't have to be in just the right language. Just say, hey, God, here we are. Simeon and Anna appear out of nowhere, and they disappear immediately. God uses us at particular moments, at particular times. God uses us no matter what our backstory is. God uses us. And all of us are called to particular service to God at a particular time and a particular place. It doesn't mean it has to be a lifelong job. God will use us in the times and places and the way God chooses to use us. As more is the is the friend Mordecai, the uncle Mordecai says to Queen Esther, perhaps you have been put in this place for a time such as this. And New Year's is a good time to be thinking about God's assurance. In my last preaching event for y'all here, I want to leave you with the greatest assurance that God is with you. Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior that you have been put in this time and place for a time such as this. We have, um, at home, we have millions of coffee cups, and they all kind of get uh, rotated in and out of service. 
But one stays right in front. It's, it's from Jeremiah, and it stays right in front in the cabinet. And it's these words. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. And I'll continue. To give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me, says the Lord, and come and pray to me, I will hear you. For when you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. Amen. <laughs>